All right, Hebrews chapter 13. Let's finish this chapter tonight. There's some good things that we can glean from here. Now remember that Hebrews chapter 13 is mostly Christian doctrine. It would make a lot of sense if Paul was writing to the churches during the latter part of his ministry. So we are going to focus on that. I'm going to try to do tribulation application at times here and there. But this is going to be mostly Christian doctrine, okay? This is mostly going to be Christian doctrine. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 13, and we will look at verse 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. Okay, so due to verse 14, that we have no continuing city, we don't have any city on this earth where we can continue to live, there's one that's coming that we're looking forward to, right? That is the heavenly city. Because of that, that's why he says, therefore, because of that, we should offer God who deserves that, who is going to give us that heavenly city. He deserves praise. We should offer praise to him constantly. The word of God calls this praise sacrifice. So you can see here that this is a spiritual act. When we are praising God, the Lord spiritually sees that as offering sacrifices to him. The verse says, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So from your very lips, as you give praise to God, God sees that as fruit to him. Fruit that is offered on that sacrifice. And that gives thanks to God's name. Now, what's somewhat interesting is that, if you recall, Cain's sacrifice, it was fruits and vegetables, right? So that was very much looked down or frowned upon. But there's, there is a paradox here at verse 15. It's, it is the opposite in this case. The Lord considers it as something valuable to him, because it's spiritual fruit. It's spiritual fruit. When you constantly give thanks to the Lord, that's aligned with singing praises, so to speak. And the Lord sees that as sacrifice. Amen. Now, there are two cases of sacrifice that a Christian uh, can give to the Lord that we are going to examine. And the first one, like I talked about, is praise. I want you to turn to Romans 12. Romans 12. So it's a no-brainer to us that we are supposed to constantly praise God, give thanks, and sing hymns. But it's another thing where hard times happen. Can you still give thanks or praise to Him? Now, this is what I think. I think that from this passage, it's not just singing hymns. That's just a part of it. It says sacrifice, correct? If it says sacrifice, that means you're basically suffering something. You're sacrificing something when you give thanks to Him. I don't really see it as much sacrifice when you're in a good mood and we just sing hymns together. But I see it more so as when you go through hard times in your life and you don't want to sing hymns, but you force your flesh to come to church anyway, some of you drove more than an hour through this horrible traffic, and you took time off of your busy schedule just to what? Not even miss the singing of hymns and to come during the teaching service, but making sure that you would not miss the singing part. And you come on time for singing. You come early to church so that you can sing hymns even though you're going through a lot of hard times. That is sacrifice. Yeah. If you lose a loved one or a family member, bad things happen to you. You're undergoing a storm or a trial, but yet you give thanks to the Lord and you sing hymns. That's a sacrifice. So I think in this case, it's not just singing hymns. It's more so, it's also including when you're going through actual sacrifice, actual hard times. And the reason why I think that 
is because of verse 16, the second one, which we're going to cover later. Basically, the person is sacrificing their money. So a person is giving up something. When you're praising God, something's got to give up. You see what I mean? Something's got to give up. I see this really as sacrificing when you praise God. A great song, and our brother Jack, he sang the song, When Praise Demands a Sacrifice. It's a really, really good song. Uh, some of the wordings go, When praise demands a sacrifice, I will worship even then, surrendering the dearest things in life, and when devotion costs me all, you'll find me faithful to his call when praise demands a sacrifice. God hears the words of praise uh, we live, and I have found he offered more than what I'm willing to lay down. When praise demands a sacrifice, I will worship even then. Really good song. I mean, for some of you who are curious, you can look it up. Very, very good song. I don't know if you forgot Brother Jack singing that song, but it was a very good song. Romans chapter 11 and chapter 12. This is where I think the complementary verse shows praise being a sacrifice to him. If we look at chapter 11... Verse 36, for of him and through him and to him are all things. Notice, to whom be glory forever. Amen. You notice that? What the person's doing here is he's praising God for all the good things he's done, right? But notice, he says, I beseech you what? Therefore, right? In Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore. What does that mean, therefore? It's following the context of chapter 11, verse 36, when he's praising God. Yeah. So because he's praising God, Paul is saying, that's why I beseech you to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, we know what that means. That means literally you're sacrificing your body for him. Yeah. You notice that right there? On the context of praise, there should be something your body sacrifices to him. Amen. That's a good verse. Yeah. And that's a good song if, that you should look up later on when praise demands a sacrifice. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is what? Your reasonable service. In other words, it's very reasonable. It's not unreasonable when you sacrifice something of your body as you praise God. That's not unreasonable. God is not being unfair to you. Every martyr, think about it, that died while singing hymns, that act of praise, that was not an unreasonable service to God. It was actually very reasonable, the least that they could do for Him. Remember that song that I quoted to you before that... God hears the words of praise we live, and I have found he offered more than what I'm willing to lay down. If you look at the context of chapter 11, see verse 36, he's praising him, right? But notice verse 35. Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. See, in other words, you can't pay back enough to a being like that who gave so much to you. Look at verse 33, 33. See that? Oh, the death of the riches, how much he's given to you. All right, now let's go back to Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. Really good verse. Really good verses. So praise is not just in a good mood. I do not believe in that. I don't think that's what the author had in mind. I think he meant like literally every day of your life, including moments of suffering, including sacrificial moments. So good mood has nothing to do with it. That's what I believe. I really believe that it has to do with payment, cost, sacrifice. All right, uh, can they see that or did I put it out of bounds? Oh, the good mood's out of bounds, sorry. All right, uh, is it up to here then I assume? 
Okay, then. <laughs> they think it's good food, you know, that's what they think. <laughs> All right, then. So, I do not believe that good mood has anything to do with that. Good? All right. All right, I want you now look at the next verse, which we're going to talk about communicating. Verse 16, but to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. God is well pleased with another type of sacrifices, plural. And the, the other two are doing good to people and communicate. Communicate is not where you treat each other well and socialize. That's not what it means. Communicate here has to do with monetary giving. Now, doing good, I think, is separate, but you'll notice how it pretty much subsequently follows communicate. These things kind of go hand in hand quite often. You're going to notice that. We're going to look at Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Now that is a sacrifice when you're doing good to people and giving money to them. I don't think the author was thinking when you're in a good mood again, right? right. Or when you have a lot of money or when you don't have to put up much effort. This is pretty obvious that the context is when a person is giving up something, is putting up an effort. Look, uh, in church, it's not easy being good to people, but we are supposed to. Why? It's called a sacrifice to the Lord. Jesus was more than good to you, and he sacrificed a lot. There's no such thing. One thing I do not like, and we should never have in this church, is clicks or your favorite buddy-buddy. Okay? There's no such thing. Every brother and sister in Christ is a brother and sister in Christ. Remember, I emphasize so many times, if there's someone you did not say hi to, someone you did not talk to, at least say one or two sentences to them and then let them respond back. I mean, if you got 30 people giving two sentences each, that's 60 sentences. I think that's a pretty good day, so will you please do good to each other, right? Let's never forget that. That's good, bro. Let's never forget that. You know why we became a great church, right? Why we're good with people, right? Why other people like us? Or did you forget? It's because we're, we're used to being good to each other. And look, we are an odd church, all right? You, you all should know that by now, all right? We're an odd church. We got many different personalities, nationalities, differences. I mean, we're a very weird bunch. But I, I, I take it as a huge honor and privilege to pastor this group of people in church. All right? We're not professionals like BBCI or the, Pastor Gunther's Church in Michigan. All right? We're basically all over the floor. That's the type of church we are. But, but man, it, we're an interesting bunch. That's what makes it interesting. That's what makes it adventurous, is it not? I, I keep joking, you know, I keep joking with people, but I mean it seriously, too, is that yeah. literally you can make a TV show that go 10 seasons long with our church, and it's going to be a very interesting show. I'm pretty, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure of it. I'm pretty sure of it, all right? It's because we are, de why? Because we don't despise each other's person. We embrace it. We know that that's who you are, and we just learn to get along and just get a good time out of it. Man, can you imagine God up in heaven? He's probably the one that's most pleased enjoying this TV show. Amen, brother. And he's, and he's got all the next seasons prepared for us. Man, remember... Reach that, brother. Come on. Remember how I keep telling this church, like, you... Come to this church, I promise you this, you're not going to be bored. Yeah. All right, there's going to be hardship. Yeah, the devil's going to attack you. All right, as soon as you walk in, there's going to be problems. And then, but I promise you this, it won't be boring. Yeah. All right, you're going to see a lot of action. Yeah. We're going to see a lot of climax. We're going to see a lot of plot twists. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to see a lot of plenty of comedy in the meantime. Yeah. All right, yeah. 
with tragedy mingled with it. All right? I mean, we are a TV show, all right? That's why we're on YouTube and people think... Didn't you know some people are identifying themselves with some of the characters in our, in our church? You know how many are doing that? Some of them are talking to some of you preachers and identifying themselves with you and going, man, I'm so proud of you. You know, it's been a long journey together. They're acting weird now, you know. They're acting weird. Now, I'm not... Now, <laughs> Now, that's pretty cool how it turned out, but obviously, I am not condoning people to watch us online and thinking, oh, that's my church, identifying with you. No, you go to your local Amen, church, brother. and Amen. you start your own adventure. Yeah. Amen. All right? Don't do a virtual thing, and then you end up like many people who are just stuck on TV, and then they end up being a loser who identify themselves with a the character when they themselves could be that own character that they can make an impact. All right? All right, well, anyway, Galatians chapter 6. So doing good, but also giving money to each other. Galatians chapter 6. Notice in verse 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So notice right here that the People who are being taught the Word of God, they're supposed to communicate to Him. That doesn't mean socialize to Him, but uh, socialize with Him, but give Him money. Another more plain text that will show it is Philippians. Go to the book of Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Now notice that this is called a sacrifice when you give money, all right? Philippians chapter 4, verse 15. Philippians 4, verse 15. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. So this is very apparently uh, money. But look at this, verse 18. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. The ones they communicated to him, right? The money, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. So it is a sacrifice to God. Now, when you give uh, money to the church, and you know me, I'm not a mo money-hungry person, all right? To be quite honest, the Lord has really surpassed my needs, so I don't really need it. But uh, when you give money in the offering plate, are you costing something? You have to ask yourself that. Are you sacrificing something? If it's a walk in the park for you, then there's something you got to check, right? Okay. So check your heart on that one. It's got to be a sacrifice. That's one thing, uh, you know, uh, what I am so proud to say about this church is that this is the sacrifice uh, that, I can uh, that I can confidently say about verse 15 and 16 uh, easily whenever I talk to other pastors or missionaries or other churches. I mean, I'm going to tell them, if I tell them that, hey, my guys, when they come, I mean, they're going to sing with all their hearts. They're going to pump you guys up. I mean, I'm not saying that just to show off, but I'm telling them the truth and letting them know, hey, it's, you're you guys are going to get a great time. If I say that fellowship's going to be good, they're going to get along well with you, uh, with you people. If I say that to different missionaries or churches, I mean that. That's how confident I am. Why? Because you, you're good in sacrificing to do good. And when I tell guest speakers that, hey, you're going to get a generous love offering, I'm glad that I can say that with confidence. Why? Because I know my people give sacrificially. Ain't that a blessing to every pastor? I never had that for years, you know, so... All right, if we look at verse 16, notice with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Now, this is something that you probably want to mark down. When did God ever say well pleased to any individual? Think about it. There's only one individual in the Bible, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He never gave that kind of a high compliment to any other person, but he gives you okay. that chance. See that there? Why? All you have to do, 
is praise Him as you undergo suffering and give sacrificially your money and do good to other people. Amen. Now, this church has undergone a lot of sacrifice, but do you know how much of an incense we're giving up to God that's well-pleasing to Him? See that? So this is actually an opportunity. No one likes sacrifice or pain, but know this, you are now doing the well-pleasing to God. All right, let's look at verse 17. Verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls. So the verse says that those who rule over you, you're supposed to obey. You're supposed to submit to their authority. So who are these people? These people are those who watch for your souls. Those who keep an eye on, who feed it who take care of it, help you grow. So this is pretty apparent. These are referring to ministers right here. So a Christian, we talked about how they give sacrifices, but now they're supposed to be, you'll notice the symbol right here, they're supposed to be in a position of submission. And over here, they're supposed to give authority to, they're supposed to give obedience to the minister. Why? Because they're watching for your soul. As they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. Because one day the ministers are going to give an account for how they took care of you. And you don't want them to give account with grief, with hardship. Right. You want them to give, a, uh, give account to others with joy. So think about this. If a pastor uh, has to report or give account of his church to others, what can he say about them? I mean, if, I were, if they were to ask me about Bible Baptist Church, are there some things that I can joyously tell them that I'm confident what my members would do? Or will I have to say it's still a new church? They're still bound by this culture, so you need to be patient. You need to take time. Do I have to give heads up to speakers and warnings wow. to speaker that, hey, the people here, they're a little tender. They're still babes in Christ, so j just be wary. Hey, that happens. Yeah. For real. See, you don't want the pastors uh, giving grief when they give account of their people. You want them to give them with joy. Basically, you want the pastor to say to any preacher, lay it all out. Just preach how the Holy Spirit leads your heart. And then we can enjoy a great blowout. And every preacher, you can see that, that they enjoy a good time and they preach very freely on that pulpit. Yes. Yes. That's what I want. That's what I want. But what's uh, a further scary thought is that they must give account to God. So they have to give a report. See that right here? So notice that just like this member, they have a position of submission. They're, they have a position where they have to submit to a higher authority, which is God himself, and they have to report to them about certain people in their church. Why did so-and-so did that? And then you want the minister to tell God with grief about member so-and-so? I mean, that's really hard on them. Think about this. If you're scared to give account of yourself at the judgment seat of Christ, what about the minister who has to give account of himself and for others at the same time? Right. Yeah. See, that's, uh, that's why you see right here, when God tells you to obey and submit to them, it's not a demanding thing. It's actually a very understandable reason because they have to give an account to God for how you lived, for how they watched for your soul. It's going to be a grievous thing at the judgment seat of Christ. I, I can't imagine how many Bible-believing ministers I can think of who start their ministries in hard areas or missionaries who are going to be doing that. Yeah, that's, wow. Did you notice, like, when you read their letters too, you think a lot of it is joy mingled with grief or more so of grief than joy? You see what I mean here? Man, imagine if I had to write a letter. <laughs> That'd be bad, right? <laughs> That'd be horrible. That'd be horrible, man. <laughs> 
So that's the reason why you have to realize this is very important that if the pastor is asking for help or preaching something, something that you need to adhere to, uh, get involved. Yeah. Get involved, follow, 100% support. Don't be the last one to walk inside the church service and the one who is the least involved in doing things in the church or the one who becomes the disappointed the one who is the burden to the other people in the church. You don't want to be that person. You don't want to be that guy. This is a very powerful wording right here. The last one is, for that is unprofitable for you. So notice this. This is not to benefit or to profit the minister. The reason why you're supposed to obey and submit to the minister is because it's supposed to benefit and profit you. Now, to pound on the ministers, there are uh, too many uh, IFB ministers who take abusive roles. And then the reason why they demand submission and obedience is so that they can be profited. Okay. If that's the case, then they're not even following Hebrews 13, 17 correctly. Right. Hebrews 13, 17 is not more so to profit the minister, but it's to profit the member. So if the obedience and submission comes out in a way that profits the member more than the minister, then that is the right thing to do. Did that make any sense? All right, so we do know that pastoral authority does have its limits then, even in verse 17. And by the way, verse 17 is one of the, mo uh, one of the, most, uh, well, uh, mo one of the most used passages to prove pastoral authority including for IFB abusive pastors. Yeah, yeah. So you can even show them from their own text that it's got to profit the member more than the minister. Okay. That's good, bro. Now, returning back to you, because it's supposed to be profitable for you members, it's interesting, on, for that is unprofitable for you. So there's something uh, that is not profitable to you in verse 17, we've got to find out what that is. So there, there are two, I believe, that could be the case. There are two that I believe could be the case. So then one is going to be the more obvious one that people are thinking is as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. So in other words, when the minister is giving account of the members to God, that is not profitable to you if they have to give account of you with grief. Yeah. Now, did you notice that right there? Yeah. That's something very important. Get this now. When the minister is giving account of himself to God, it's not only grievous to him, okay? For him... He might have grief when he gives account to God or joy, and hopefully it's the latter or joy. But notice right here, by that particular action of giving account to God, there's something going on here that does not profit you. That does not benefit you. I mean, how does that not benefit you? Because after all, it's only the minister that goes through grief, right? Not the member. So how is that not profitable for you? So what does that mean? That means there's going to be something that that minister does when he gives account to God about you is going to make it unprofitable for you is going to make you lose profit. Did that make any sense? So in other words, picture this. Here is the judgment seat of Christ, and already you messed up, and the bonfire burned it up. And then you got scraps and leftovers, and then God says, wait, wait, I'm not done. Yeah. Pastor so-and-so, come here. Yeah. Okay. All right, do you think he or she should get that reward? Now, do you think the ministers of God are in joy to say, he sure don't deserve it? No. Because pastor's job is watching for your souls, right? Yeah. If they truly watch for your souls, that means they're caring about you. Yeah. And people who care don't like to see someone that they care about lose more rewards 
or profit? Well, God, I mean, uh, he really tried his best. I know he's weak, Father, but he really tried his best. And God's like, no, 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 you've got to give account. God's going to demand from that minister. Boy, I'm not enjoying this, okay? You think you're not enjoying it. I'm not enjoying this, okay? But this must be said. He's going to demand and force that minister to be as honest and hard as he can Amen. on what that member if he or she should deserve it or lose it. Right. Now, you know me, all right? I ain't, I ain't going to say anything bad about you, all right? I really don't like that. If someone asked me of that, I'm go I, I can't say, well, you know, you got to understand this person's a baby Christian. Well, you got to understand this person had this problems going on, and I can't say that to God. Yeah. I can say that down here, all right? And I, because I care about you and I understand you. But when it comes to that maker there, he's going to demand it out of me. And you're going to be looking at me. And I'm going to be looking at you. Do you know how both of us are going to be in utmost grief? Because me, I'm going to be looking at you and I'm going to go, no, I, I, I don't want to say it because I don't want you to feel like that, that you feel hurt or you feel betrayed by me. And then you're going to feel so hurt because you're going to go, please, no, please, no, please. This is all that I've got in my reward. Yeah. Well, that wasn't fun, was it? That wasn't fun. Okay. So that's unprofitable for you. The second one might be a better option, right? So <laughs> I would sure hate that first option. All right? But that sure makes a lot of sense, that first option, doesn't it? All right. The second option would probably be preferable, but it's not really better, okay? So if it's not the minister giving account, it's them who are watching for your souls. In other words, if you don't obey or submit to them who are trying to watch out for you, hey, don't touch that. Hey, watch out for that. Hey, I wouldn't do that if I were you. And they give you counsel. Make sure you do it this way. See, when they're watching out for you, be careful of that heresy out there. Be careful of that online thing that you watch. Yeah. See, when they're doing that and you're not obeying or submitting to them, what happens? That's not profitable for you because you're going to damage your own spiritual growth. Now, that, that's not, that doesn't... That doesn't sound nice either, okay? That doesn't sound like, oh, that's much better than the first option that I heard. Well, <laughs> I mean, it's pretty hurtful. Let me show you something interesting. Compare that word with 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And bless God, let's move on, all right? <laughs> yeah, amen, brother. You're more spiritual. Yeah, you're more, spi you're more spiritual than me, brother. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish this fast because I'm not that spiritual. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And then verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, correct? So scripture is supposed to profit you for what? Doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, Truly furnished unto all good works. Now notice that the Word of God, it has the power to help you spiritually grow. Completeness. And it gives you everything. Reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, etc. And it's profitable, right? That's what profits you. But here's a question for you. Who preaches the scriptures that are profitable for you? Who counsels you through the scriptures that is profitable for you? Who teaches the scriptures that is profitable for you? And do not those preachers give you doctrine, give you reproof, give you correction, give you instruction in righteousness? You know what you're losing then if you don't obey them? That's the bottom line. If you don't obey or submit to them, you lose all these benefits. You lose right doctrine, and that does happen. You should see members who go rogue and rebel mode. They become cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs online with a bunch of weird cuckoo doctrines. They don't take, uh, they lose the reproof because they don't like it. Then they don't get profit. They don't receive correction. 
and they refuse instruction in righteousness. See that there? This, this all matches up. So they can't watch for your souls then. And that's not just something that doesn't profit them. It's more so of you. It's not going to profit you. If you look at Acts chapter 20, let's go to Acts 20. Uh, Brother Max, can you raise the temperature one degree up? Up, yeah. Don't want people to catch a cold. So, Acts chapter 20. Notice what Paul said. That is his job. Notice in Acts chapter 20 and verse 20. Look at the wording here. He says that he's supposed to watch for their souls. So he's supposed to give the whole counsel of God. He's supposed to protect them from wolves out there so that they can be profited. Okay, Acts chapter 20, verse 20. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you and I've taught you publicly and from house to house. See that there? Notice that he warns about the wolves when he reads verse, uh, when he mentions verse 27. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. Verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. So there's going to be heresies, wolves, who are going to try to devour your spiritual growth. But the preacher's job is to watch for your souls. Now, there's no doubt that this context is in mind. And this is another supporting factor that Paul certainly wrote Hebrews 13. If we're not 100% sure that Paul wrote the whole book of Hebrews, we do know he definitely wrote Hebrews 13. Because Acts 20, about being the shepherd, watching the flock, and then uh, profitable in the ministry, having a clean conscience, giving all the counsel of God because they're going to give account to God. All of that is in Acts 20 and Hebrews 13 as we keep reading. So let's keep reading Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience. See that? Remember that matched Acts 20? He says that I am free from the blood. Uh, my hands are clean. There is no blood on my hand. If you go back to Acts 20, let me read that briefly. I mean, it's all the same wording here. So there's no doubt it's the same person. It's got to be Paul. He says in Acts 20, 26, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned declare, to declare unto you all the counsel of God. He says right here, pray for us. So he asks the Hebrews to pray for them because he trusts that he and the other ministers have a good conscience. So they all have a good conscience. They're free from the blood of all men and all things willing to live honestly. So they got nothing to hide. They, every step that they've done in a, is an honest living. So members... And then souls out there won't find anything legitimate to criticize them because they did everything honestly. Now, this is a very needful verse, not just for ministers. I know that the focus here is for ministers, but it can apply to all Christians here. Now, let's first focus on the ministers, and then you yourselves can see how it can apply to Christians in general as I talk about the ministers. But Paul asks that he asks everyone to pray for them because why? Why does he want them to pray for them? He's talking about something here that uh, he's got nothing to hide, right? He lived honestly. He's got a good conscience. So in other words, it sounds like that it's referring to the government. It's referring to his enemies, his, his critics out there. So he wants the members to pray for him and other Bible-believing preachers who are being accused, who are uh, going to be judged by the government leaders and the enemies, 
And he's saying, I got a good conscience. I lived honestly. I got nothing to hide, so I'll be okay. Now, the, the reason why that is the case is because of verse uh, 23. He points out that uh, their brother Timothy is in prison. You'll also notice in verse 19, verse 19, the author Paul is not restored to them. In other words, it sounds like he's in prison. So that's the reason why he asked the brethren to pray for them, for they've got nothing to hide. Now, I want you to go to Ephesians 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And once more in uh, Acts chapter 20, I'll read it again. Acts chapter 20. He mentions right here that, uh, let's see. Uh, nah, forget that one. Yeah, forget that one. Okay, but anyway, uh, Acts chapter 20, we already read it before. He's pure from the blood of all men. So he has a clean conscience. And then also he mentions in Ephesians chapter 6 about the armor of God. Now, you remember that sermon from Pastor Welder? Yeah. That was really good, wasn't it? So, in Ephesians chapter 6, you'll know that verse. The Bible points out in, uh, let's see right here, verse 14, stand therefore. Verse 14, stand therefore. Just like Paul, who is confronting, standing against his enemies, against the government leaders, right? How is he able to stand? Because having your loins girt about with truth. That's very important, otherwise you cannot confront your enemies. If you're going to confront your enemies and you go through conflict, then you got to be bound by truth. So the question is, are you bound by truth? You'll notice right here that the Christians are supposed to pray for the minister because in return, they live a life of truth that benefits them, that benefits them. Why is this uh, belt of truth necessary? So the loins is basically an area where all your strength is at. So there will be no strength if you don't have honest living. A lot of Bible-believing Christians, if you heard that sermon from Pastor Welder, it's pretty much a repeat of it. But if you don't live honestly or you're not honest with yourself, you're not going to last long in the ministry. So the reason why there's a lot of ministers who have trouble still with, for example, their relationship with their wives is because they refuse to be honest with themselves. Okay. So then the arguments just go on endlessly because they just want to win an argument or they want to be the one that's right. But they refuse to be honest with themselves and find out their defects, okay. their faults that they want to fix. So that's why a lot of ministers don't last. Ministers are crumbling in their ministry because they're not honest with themselves. Like, for example, they're not watching over their health. Okay. Or they're pushing themselves. Mm -hmm. Or they're pushing their family members. Okay. Or they're pushing their members. Or they compromise some things here and there in the ministry that they weren't supposed to do. But see, they're so caught up with the machinery of their own way of doing things in the ministry that they've refuse to be honest with themselves and find out their defects and imperfections that they need to work on and fix. And guess what? That applies to all believers and Christians. There are things that we just want to forget. Our own defects and faults that we don't want to confront and be honest with. If you constantly live your life that way, you're not going to stand a long time and confront issues in life for the Lord. The best way, I can't tell you enough, that was my strength. I knew exactly what Pastor Welder was talking about. But as God is my witness, and probably my wife would be the other witness, is that the only way that I could fight through problems in life, no matter how hard the trial is, is that I have to take a good look at myself and be honest. 
when I do that, I fix those issues and I get refreshed and I can battle those hardships later on. But there's a lot of people who don't want to confront that. And I'm really pounding hard on this on you Christians because we live in a day and age we're not honest with ourselves and we just want to pretend those defects don't exist. And if you won't fix those problems, it's going to haunt you one day when those issues come. I promise you because I am a God honest witness on that because there's always a new attack the devil gives to me. You know what helped me with that new attack? Because of the previous things that I got right with God a long time ago. If I didn't get those things previously right, those new attacks would have torn me asunder. I don't know if that made any sense to you. But this is, but this is very important. Otherwise, you're not going to survive the next attack. Let's go to uh, Hebrews 13, please. Hebrews 13. So can you say that? For we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. You got to check yourself, okay? All right, verse 19. But I beseech you the rather to do this. So he's begging them to rather do this part of prayer. Not just praying for them to, uh, praying for them to stand against their enemies with their honest testimony, but more so uh, that I may be restored to you the sooner. So that's what he wants uh, more prayer on, is that, hey, that I get out of this uh, prison and then, or house arrest and I can be with all of you. Some of you understand what that is like, right? <laughs> uh, me as a pastor, I like that prayer. We have some members here who want to come back to be with God's people. So you can imagine that. So we can guess here that Hebrews 13, see, is the latter part of Paul's ministry when he's in prison. But recall that the beginning of the book of Hebrews, I pointed out that it could have been written uh, in the early part of Paul's ministry, right? Probably when he was in Arabia, when he was trained by God for two years. If you recall all those things, you might also Remember that I mentioned to you that Hebrews 13 could have been written much later on, and then Paul wrote the beginning chapters of Hebrew a long time ago. Now, here's another thing to uh, keep in mind. Another thing to keep in mind, I'm very surprised how much I'm going slow. I got to get going, otherwise <laughs> we're not going to finish Hebrews, all right? But I, but I better finish this quickly. But let me explain this part about the theory on the book of Hebrews, which might be very helpful about the timeline of the book, okay? The timeline of the book of Hebrews, remember I mentioned that it could have been written by Paul uh, at the beginning and then later written on at the latter half of his ministry. But the question is, if you look at the style of writing, you'll notice that the first chapters are lengthy, right? They are lengthy. But then chapter 13 is shorter. You'll notice that. There's no doubt there's a difference here. So what's going on? What could be possible about the timeline of the book of Hebrews when it was written? All right, let me know if it's out of bounds, brother, okay? All right, when it was written. Paul may have been eloquent because he's a Pharisee Sadducee. So uh, because he's still coming out of that, when he wrote the book of Hebrews, it came out very scholarly, see, intellectual. So that could be very possible, is that Paul's early life contained that. But then we do know later on, as he got better in his preaching and as he was ministering more to down-to-earth people, his language was more down-to-earth. His preaching was more to the point. Now, I can fully understand that because when I started my ministry I was giving blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and it wasn't really to the point because, you know, I just was studying in higher ed classes and all these dots were connecting and then, you know, people didn't know what, what was what. <laughs> I noticed the more that I pastor or preached and taught, the more I was able to break down better, the more I was able to specify further. Now, if that's not the case with you, I'm sorry. And then you, you pressured me just now, and I'm going to have to work more on my teaching preaching. <laughs> but Paul's early uh, life and 
later. So that's possibility one. That makes a lot of sense with the difference of uh, wording and tone. Another thing which could be possible is that chapter 13 was written by Paul, but then the beginning chapters were written by other Jewish Bible-believing ministers. Now, uh, why would I say that? The reason why is this, is because it was written to Hebrews, right? Now, if you recall, Paul didn't really have a ministry to the Jews, but he really wanted to. So it may be that multiple authors got together and they added Paul because Paul wants to minister to the Hebrews and they all together came together and give, gave the letter of Hebrews to the Jews. Now, is that possible? Yes, in the, there are several books in the Bible that had multiple authors, not just one. So that is very possible. Uh, second thing could be, uh, that. so that's the second reason, is that Paul's early life and later, or it did happen uh, during a timeline of Jewish apostles or Jewish ministers combined with Paul. So that could explain. The other indications is you'll notice Paul said in verse 18, us, for we trust we. And he's referring to the ministers, right? The leaders. So the leaders to the Jewish believers. So that can make a lot of sense why there were uh, Jewish believers in the early part of the book of Hebrews that gave tribulation doctrine because they were ministering to Jews. But then Paul, later on in life, when he wrote chapter 13, he was giving church age doctrine. That can make a lot of sense too with the mingling. All right, now in verse 20, now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, in other words, God of peace, that, uh, God is full of peace, obviously. He was the one that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep. That's found in John chapter 10. John 10 shows Jesus is the great shepherd of us, the sheep. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. Meaning that Jesus Christ, through the blood of his covenant, now remember that covenant that he made, when he died on the cross, was to the church age. It was a new covenant. Now that is the spiritual covenant. We're not talking about the national covenant for the Jews, all right? So this is a different one. It's a spiritual covenant to Christians. Jesus Christ, uh, he, when he shed his blood, it was to represent that church age. And that blood, notice, has the power, has the power for you to continue in doing effective works for God. Has the power to make you perfect in every good work as you follow His will. Working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight. So that blood of Christ is working within you, things that you can become well-pleasing in God's sight. Now, Revelation chapter 12, okay? You know that verse, but write it down, Revelation 12. This is probably, these two are probably the best verses that proves and shows you the power of the blood. It's not just a, a symbol to forgive sins. So MacArthur is very wrong here. It's not just washing away sins. It has power to uh, make you overcome things in life, believe it or not. That's what I personally believe. So notice in Revelation 12, 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. They overcame who? Satan. At verse 10. So notice that the blood of the Lamb here, it has power to do effective works. Hebrews 13, verse 20 through 21 is another evidence. See that? Makes you do a, 
The, that's all through the blood. So think about this. The secret ingredient to, for power in your life is not just the filling of the Holy Spirit, but also the blood. Amen. Quite often, I would synonymously pray for the Spirit to fill me and for His blood to cleanse me and to cover me. I would do that simultaneously quite often. Verse 21, the next part says, Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So all of this is done through Jesus Christ. And we give him the glory. We praise him forever and ever. Amen to that. Amen. Now notice also that the blood is everlasting at verse 20. See that? Yeah. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant. No, MacArthur, it's not just the blood and evaporated and that it doesn't have special power. It does have special powers. I believe in that. It does have special powers. It's everlasting, the verse says. The blood is everlasting. That does, it didn't evaporate in Ghana at Calvary. Amen. As we continue reading on, and I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation. Uh, Paul's asking the brethren, he's begging them to put up with his exhortation, <laughs> his word of exhortation, everything that he says to them. Because he reasons, for I've written a letter unto you in few words. So he says, because I only wrote just a few things, a few, few stuff in this letter. If he said that, then chapter 13 makes a lot of sense. It's few wordings. But if you look at chapter 1 through 12, those are long wordings. So it would make a lot of sense if Paul was the one who wrote chapter 13, and then there were other authors who wrote chapter 1 through 12. Now, perhaps, maybe Paul, if he wrote the whole book of Hebrews, he's saying that it could be, number one, the Jews, they're used to lo longer words in their books. And that's pretty evident if you look at the Old Testament, right? right. Yeah, they're, they're long, long wordings. Or it could be, secondly, that he's saying that the stuff that I'm preaching and teaching to you is actually a mild, it's actually small compared to how I preach longer hours. You might recall yeah. where he preached a long time. Yes. Even the Holy Spirit yes. thought it was a long yeah. time that he wrote it. Yeah. And then one of them couldn't take it anymore and fell out the window and died. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Verse 23, know ye that our brother Timothy... He said, at liberty with whom, if he comes shortly, I will see you. Meaning that he says, you all know that our brother Timothy is going to be free from prison soon. So this is no doubt the latter part of Paul's ministry. Timothy got in prison too. And he says, uh, if, if he comes very soon, and I will, uh, I will see you all with him, with Timothy, with whom. That's what he meant. Verse 24, salute all them that have the rule over you and all the saints. He says to the Hebrews, make sure that you greet uh, and say hi to uh, the ministers who take care of you. Those are the ones who rule over you. And all, the peop and all the saints, the people in church. So what do I say every time when preaching is over? Please don't leave without saying bye and hi to me and to all of us. Why? Because that's scriptural. You want a verse proof? That's verse 24, okay? <laughs> it seems like a command or not a suggestion at verse 24. <laughs> they of Italy salute you. Now he says those, uh, those in Italy also greet them, meaning he is in Italy. Yeah. So this sounds like that he is in house arrest during that time when he was at Rome. And he really wanted to minister to the Hebrews. So because of that, that's the reason why he wrote chapter 13. So it would make a lot of sense if that was the case. But again, that's an if. And let's close. Grace be with you all. Amen. Yeah. All right. So uh, Paul says, uh, bids them grace, bids all of them grace to the Jews. And he says, amen. Now, there's an interesting italics. Yeah. Notice this is written to the Hebrews from Italy by what? 
Now, that's pretty interesting. Now, it doesn't seem like Timothy because of verse 23, right? But like I told you before, Paul is clearly the author of chapter 13. However, the whole letter could have been written by Timothy. It may have been written by Timothy, and then he just added Paul's, le Paul's letter at uh, chapter 13. But again, this brings up another possibility to the mysterious author of the book of Hebrews. And we finished, so far, my favorite book of the Bible that I taught to all of you. Amen. This has been a great blessing. A lot of do deep doctrines, dispensational stuff, practical stuff, especially regarding sacrificial living and suffering. Lots of good stuff we learned. Amen. All right, y'all pray about the next book that I teach you. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll dismiss uh, tonight's service with your blessing. Thank you for your book, Father. This was just one book, yeah. Hebrews. What a huge blessing we got out of it, yeah. verse by verse. What more, what more do we, uh, what, what more can we expect from your other books? We are very excited, Lord. Christianity sure is not boring. Church is not boring. Bible study is not boring. We always anticipate the next episode that you're going to give to us. Help us to live it like uh, life to the fullest in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.